Hey, good morning. My name is Mohit Aran. I am the CTO of Nutanix. And I'll take you through a deep dive through our product. Um, I want to focus on our new features, uh, because in the last tech field day that we had one year back, we talked about all our stuff that we are already repeatedly selling on. So I want to touch a little bit less on that. Um, but for um, basically to give a brief background, let's begin with what hardware we are selling. So what we sell today is we have uh, basically this 2U box, which internally contains four servers, four servers, one, two, three, four. Each one of these servers has both compute and storage in it, so we are a converged platform. Uh, we have four PCI SSD, so each server has one PCI SSD. And you can have a variation. You can have between four to 12 SATA SSDs in the whole block. And you can have between 12 to 20 um, hard drives in that block. And you can, so you can mix and match. And we have a bunch of CPUs, so eight sockets of Intel, two per, two per uh, server and uh, four ESX servers. There's a hypervisor running on each of the servers. And we have four virtualized storage controllers that I'm going to talk about in my later slides. And in this uh, one 2U unit, we can give 30, about 30,000 random IOPS. And you can add them. You can scale them. Um, and in this one 2U unit, we can provide all the traditional enterprise features that uh, you, know, you have to cobble together if you buy servers from one vendor and storage from another vendor. Okay, so, so when I buy this compute plan, yeah. I'm buying a PCIe SSD? It is an option, yes. You don't have to, but yes, you, it, we provide it to you by default. We have a, so let, let me talk about, right. later in the talk, if, I'll talk about more configurations. If, if it's an option, then I'm fine with you saying that you can scale compute. It is an option. It is an option. Uh, this is another, another picture of the hardware that kind of shows you how we can kind of pull servers out of this 2U block dynamically. So if something fails, we want to replace stuff, you can just pull it out, uh, pull it back in without affecting the availability of the rest of the system. And typically, this one 2U unit will replace some 10U worth of equipment that you can buy elsewhere. So a whole rack full is replaced by this 2U. So this picture takes you um, through the internals. So let's see what sits inside these servers. So again, this is server number one, server number two. And you can stack, stack them together. So this is server number n. In one block, you get four servers. Um, so let's see what's inside one of these servers. Well, what you see here is, first of all, you have the local storage. So this stuff here is the SSD, the PCIe SSD. And you have the SATA drive sitting there. So the storage sits internal to the system. It's not outside. What I draw here, these are the guest VMs running on the system. So we have a virtualization appliance. So that we can run any number of guest VMs. On one block, you can run some 300 to 400 guest VMs. And there's a special VM, which is called the controller VM. And this is where um, our intelligence goes. This is where our software sits. So what we export to the guest VM is this blue thing. This is, to the guest VM, this just looks like a SCSI drive. When I.O. is done by the guest VM to the SCSI drive, it goes to ESX, which then sends it to us through an industry standard protocol like iSCSI or NFS. And then we decide where to place the data. Typically, we would place, we'll would try to place one copy here and then one copy on one of the remote nodes so that if this guy dies, you still have one copy available. And all the controller VMs work together to form a distributed system. OK? Any questions on this? And we can just stack them. Like I said, if you buy the first guy from us, and to scale, you can just buy more, more, and more, and they kind of scale uh, infinitely. There's so one simple <laughs> thing here that most people actually uh, don't get is the fact that you don't have to buy four at a time because each block is four nodes. But you don't have to buy four plus four. You can say two plus one plus one plus one plus one. So the unit of scalability is not a block but a node. Right. So, so um, we have a scale out iSCSI and NFS in the system, which we call Nutanix Distributed File System, or NDFS. And um, this converges the compute and storage tiers together. We almost jokingly like to call it network-less NFS, because most of the time, the traffic stays internal to the node, especially if it's read traffic. 
it tries to bring data local to you, and the data never, the accesses never leave the network, never leave the node. So it's network less and a fast. But write data is always Write data, one copy we like to write uh, remotely, unless your policies say that you only want one, one copy. You can set policies. <laughs> so uh, our uh, NDFS is optimized for virtualization workloads. What that means is we are heavily optimized for reads and writes. So if you think about a virtualized system, you basically have VMDKs to which reads and writes are coming. And typical NFS file systems optimize for benchmarks like SpecFS, which um, you know, give you high marks when you do metadata operations on them, like renames, make directory, create a file. We are instead optimized for reads and writes. And that's why we are more optimized for virtualization workloads. So if you So interesting thing is that uh, ESX doesn't know. It just looks at, uh, you know, how, how do you look at a regular NAS device or an NFS? You basically mount it using an IP address and a mount point. That's exactly how it looks like. I'll have a few slides later on that might explain this a little bit better, but ESX doesn't know. Each node sees the same IP address. That's the beauty of the architecture. <laughs> we'll, I'll have a slide. Um, so this slide uh, basically kind of summarizes the features I'm going to refer to in this talk. On the left, on the left side, I have stuff that you know, we talked about earlier. There, this is already well known about us. We, we talked about it perhaps in the last tech field day. We have you know, news stuff. Um, uh, we have news articles in them. The right, the right side is where I'm going to focus a little bit more on. The right side is where I'm going to focus a little bit more on today. Yeah, we'll, we, we can take the questions right now. We'll talk about that. Let me go through the features. We'll take, take your questions right here. So the first thing is fault tolerance. There is no single point of failure in the whole system. Any component fails, it can fail and stay down. The system will remain available. We do network raid, like, like I was uh, already discussed. So we'll, place, we'll try to place one copy locally and put uh, one copy of the data somewhere else. So it's kind of raided over the network. We do tiering. Dheeraj kind of discussed that already. Uh, you know, so hot data tries to sit closer to you, and we try to put hot data in a more higher tier like uh, the PCIe SSD. And once the data gets cold, we will run a MapReduce to find out that it's cold, and we'll move it to a lower tier like a SATA, uh, the SATA drive, or we might even move it to a remote node if there is no space on that node. Per VM configurability. Everything, every VM can be configured independently. You can put policies, okay, do you want a replication factor one, two, three? You want a compression high, medium, low? You want, everything can be configured on a per VM basis. And this is where I'll take your question on per VM configurability. Uh, any specific question that you have there? Oh, sure. So, <clears throat> I assume that, you're, that this is if I'm using NFS, not if I'm using NSCSI. Both. When you have 10,000 VMs, you can have 10,000 iSCSI labs. Ah, so you cheated that. Yes. <laughs> and our system has been built for hundreds of thousands of lines as well. So it's not something that only can do 512 lines or 1,024 lines. You can have as many as you want. You can also, yeah, you can also there group. Are, there are rather severe limits about how many lines one ESX host can connect to, except that there is a and the level of masking that we do. That so th this is the trick. The trick is that while ESX has a limitation, the limitation applies to only one node. So you only make sure that one node sees the, lim the limited number of LUNs. But if you want to move the motion, you can make that LUN visible elsewhere. So each node just sees 250. The limitation that ESX imposes is 256 LUNs. Right. So you make sure that if you have 10,000 LUNs, only 256 of them are visible at any one node at any time. Dynamic but the whole, yes, you can. Yes. That being okay. said, and, we, and then what does that do to workflows like DRS? You know, do I have to be doing that automatically? Yeah, so, so DRS, since the LUN is only visible on some of the nodes, not on all of the nodes, 
you can do DRS uh, from this VM to that particular node. Speaking of which node it is. Because yeah, I mean, it's safe. So because nodes, of all this kludginess of iSCSI, we have abandoned iSCSI. I mean, we liked it for what it was worth, but NFS is the way for us to go. NFS is far more seamless. It so also gels much around, better. Yeah. BMFS, iSCSI limitations. Oh. The, the, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't even want to get with, started on iSCSI. I'm with you. Okay, awesome. But, but we have the okay. problem solved in the iSCSI world too. That's what we're trying to say. Okay, so, so the recommended configuration would be to, to do this all via NFS. NFS, yes. And you're going to do per VM snapshots via NFS because you have enough context managing the file system to do that. Okay, so that, yeah, and I think the subtle point there is that file systems built in the last 15 years were doing snapshots, backup, cloning, all that stuff at the level of a volume. Right. DR policies, RAID, all that stuff was done at the level of a volume. So you had to really or, re-architect. Or lower. Or lower, whatever, you know, like RAID groups and stuff like yeah. that, right? RAID groups were defined in the case of NetApp is not even at flex walls, at the volume, it's called a physical volume. Yeah. And once you stitch that, everybody Aggregates gets that, other, right? So that's things. like uh, one of the heresies, you know, you don't do that in this late binding world at all. Right. Yeah, so I was, uh, the next feature uh, that we already have been selling for a while is snapshots, clones. Uh, we do them through VMware Y and they're per VM based. Uh, just because you want to snapshot a VM doesn't mean that you have to take a snapshot of the whole file system. You can take a snapshot of just that VM. Um, we have full VMware integration, name a VMware feature and we have it. So in this conversion plan, the interesting thing is ESX doesn't even know that it's running converged with us. It still thinks that it's talking to an NFS that potentially sits outside the plan. That's the interesting part. Uh, we have serviceability stuff, alerts, anything goes wrong in the system, we get alerts, uh, we have call home, our customers are gonna call home to us. Anything that happens in their system, we find out even before they do, stuff like that. And we have, you know, all, all this becomes possible, again, we kind of referred this already, through a MapReduce-based framework that we run in the background. So periodically, we'll just run a MapReduce, find out what's wrong with the system, or if the system needs to be healed in a certain way, move around the hot data, move around the cold data, if something's down, fix it, re-replicate it, all that's done through MapReduce. And so basically all the cluster nodes are taking part in this, rather than just one guy sitting out there crunching data. And that's what adds to the scalability. So as you grow, the power of MapReduce grows with you. So you can infinitely grow. There is no one single point of bottleneck. There's also a subtle observation in this slide that you'll see that, you know, on the left, what we did last year was basically building a prototype to see the product market fit. Then you got an awesome feedback, and on the right side is all about enterprise greatness. Pretty much every customer that we have, you know, they want all the enterprise features. And in, this is less than three years of the company. We've actually built a whole lot more than what NetApps of the world could ever have imagined. You know? and, and it just goes uh, on to say how much we believe in enterprise great features and uh, something which makes convergence really ubiquitous. So before I go to the right side, uh, which is the features that I'm going to talk about in more detail, in the later slides just in my talk. Are there any questions that I can answer about the left side? So this is stuff that I'm not going to talk about more. Yeah, um, okay. So the, the network rate thing, is this just purely uh, replication, or is there, is there erasure coding in here? Today we don't have erasure coding, but it, it's in the works, so to say. Okay. Um, it is uh, replication, but I don't want you to think that this is mirroring. Mirroring is basically taking a disk and mirroring it exactly to another disk. Which means that if one guy goes down, now you have to read the whole desk to replicate it, right? So you're putting a lot of pressure on that desk. What the, this stuff does is it takes your data on one node and spreads it around the whole network. So if, the, if this node or if one desk on this node goes down, you can restore your replication by reading data from all the nodes. So you're mirroring the strike, not the distance. I'm sorry? You're At an extent, the extent strike, level, yeah. Yeah, we don't have, no, yeah, you can think of it that way. We have the notion of extents. Yeah. And extents can live anywhere in the system, rather than like one on this guy and one on that guy. Right, and so there's two copies yeah. of, of each extent on two Correct. different drives. But Correct. The so if there are of extent B aren't necessarily in the same drive. Absolutely. As extent so if there is uh, exactly. So if there's A and B on node A, A and B do not have to be on node B. Is uh, it responsible for the relatively slow IOP performance, given that you have you know so many PCIe cards? You said thirty thousand. Yes. Yes. Thirty thousand for the whole block. For the whole chassis so of four nodes. Yes, whole chassis of four nodes. That's random write performance. Mm -hmm. Random write performance, 30,000 per, and it scales as you go up. So last time in the last tech field day, 
we demonstrated close to half a million IOPS when we scaled to some 50 nodes. Yeah, so if the question is around okay, why shouldn't you guys do better at hardware speeds? Why can't it be 120,000 IOPS or you know, based on what Fusion IO can deliver? Well, Intel is the bottleneck. Right? At the end of the day, if you were to give like 24 cores to ourselves in that thing, then of course we can actually drive IOPS to that level. But again, our nodes are also tiny. They, they're not like four socket nodes. So you can only run so many VMs on that. And those VMs actually driving 10,000 IOPS from one node is as much as you need, actually. You know. So this is not, so all the CPUs are not, we don't reserve all the CPUs for ourselves. So remember, we're also running guest VMs on us. Okay. So this is a reasonable workload. We leave enough for the guest. In fact, uh, two, we, we take one third of the, sort of the CPU capacity. Two thirds is left for the guest VMs. And in that one third, we deliver these many IOPS. That's okay. So it's just CPU constraint. It's CPU constraint, exactly. It. It's not storage constraint. Yeah, give us more CPU, we get it, we give more. What, um, and in fact, when, the, when we talk about the storage heavy nodes, when we have everything to ourselves, you can actually deliver, deliver a lot more. And is that scalable on the fly or yes. scalable? Yes. So we'll talk about dynamic configuration, dynamic addition and stuff. It's totally scalable. Okay. The interesting thing is it takes minutes to do it rather than hours and weeks and days. <clears throat> so let's go to the right side now. So I'll, basically, that's the outline of the rest of my talk, basically. And I'll step through it as I go along. The first thing I want to talk about and announce in this forum is uh, support for native DR. So we are coming up with disaster recovery in our next release, happening shortly. Uh, soon after that, and also the same release is going to talk about compression. So we're adding compression to that. I'm going to talk about some features that are already selling, but we haven't really talked about. One of them, a great one, is auto-pathing. I'll talk about it when I get to it. Rolling upgrades. How do we do rolling upgrades? Um, it's quite cute. Dynamically grow and shrink clusters in minutes. Um, we are hypervisor agnostic. In this forum, I'm also announcing that we are also adding support for KVM. So we can now solve with KVM. Uh, heterogeneous nodes. Uh, we, can, we can scale independent compute, and, and storage can be scaled in, independently. Again, a feature that we are adding in, in, this, in this forum. And enterprise-grade serviceability. I'll explain what that means uh, going forward uh, when I come to that slide. So let's talk about disaster recovery. I think everyone here kind of understands what it means. But just to give a little bit of a background, uh, you have some VMs running on your cluster. And you're concerned that disaster might strike. Um, you know, and you want to kind of uh, replicate them on another live cluster so that if disaster were to strike this cluster, you can fail over to that other cluster. Notice that this is different from backups where backups are sort of offline things, and it takes time to restore them. This is DR, or disaster recovery, is taking, uh, replicating to a remote cluster. So in this picture, I have uh, you know, a cluster one on the left, and cluster two on the right. And I've drawn them dif uh, with different sizes uh, on purpose, because they could be of a different size. You have two VMs running here, shown in uh, brown. And you want to kind of replicate that, or protect those VMs by replicating the data to this cluster. That's traditional uh, DR. Well, yeah. Well, that's not the only thing you might want to do. You might have different sets of VMs. Not all VMs are equal. So in this picture, I show the blue set of VMs to which you might want to attach a different set of policies. Maybe you want to say, that you want to replicate these guys every hour and these guys once a day. So the policies that you attach to the, to the VMs may be different. And yet, these VMs might sit on the same file system. Traditionally, what you can do, what people do is they will replicate the whole file system. So whatever policy one VM gets is kind of inherited by all other VMs. Not true in this case. You can put a policy on a per VM basis, or you can group VMs and put policies on them. That's what differentiates us. So it's point in time replication? It's point in time replication. And do these, are these VM groups data integrity groups? Are they snapping them all at the same time? Are they being quiesced all at the same Very time? Very good question. So the question is, can you snap them all at the same time? Yes, but you can also say that I have this group of 100 VMs. It is not necessary to snap them all at the same time, but it is necessary to replicate them at the same time. So you can define what we call consistency groups within these VM groups. So you can take a group of four VMs and say, I really want to snapshot these four at the same time, because I want them together at one point in time for them. But the remaining guys, I don't care if it gets snapshotted at the same time as these VMs. So we, can, we have flexibility around that. 
but you could take all the 100 and snap them all together. Well, that's not the only thing what you might want to do. You may have cluster number three, and it could have a few, few VMs running there, shown in green, and you may want to replicate that to this mother cluster, cluster number two. And this is a typical use case when you have sort of like branch offices running cluster one and cluster three, and they want to kind of replicate or protect themselves uh, using a bigger cluster that might be running in the headquarters. So that is also support. This is sort of a, a sort of a many to one kind of uh, replication that you have. Well, that's not the only thing that you can do. You may have some VMs that are running in the headquarters that you might want to protect, and you can actually protect them by replicating them at a branch office. So the point I'm going to make is that we support this many to many replication. You can have an arbitrary number of clusters that could protect each other. And you could have an arbitrary policy around subsets of VMs that you want to protect. Do you, do you support one to many as well? Yes, you, you can. So you can actually take this set of VMs, replicate it here as well as here. From the same snapshot? From the same snapshot, yes. Anything else you like? <laughs> Well, the, I think the sure, point well, here. Cluster two is in, a, is in another data center in another location with another IP yeah. address map. Yes. So now I need you to apply policies to Correct. the VMs at recovery time Correct. to make them fit. Correct. That is also possible. Uh, you know, we don't do that today, but it's coming. Uh, so, so is there an SRM connector so that I can use VMware so to do that? My next slide goes to that. So we do work with SRM. Uh, you can use SRM to do this. The reason, first of all, the reason we built native DR is because we are seeing a lot of business coming from non-VMware environments. We wanted to have an answer for that. And our native DR is far more efficient than what we can do with SRM. But we do work with SRM. So if you do work with SRM, SRM lets you do exactly that, right? Configure your IPs and stuff like that. So um, just to point out the other virtues, um, you know, it's native, so there is no other tools needed. So typical storage system, you have a DR policy where you kind of replicate your file system, and then you need a third-party tool to register your, your VMs once they've been moved over and stuff. In this case, nothing is needed. It's all self-contained. We have built-in runbook automation, so you can schedule your snapshots. You can say, hey, take a, take a snapshot every one hour, replicate it over, and expire your snapshots after this time. All that stuff is just built in. Transfers only the needed VM data dips. So one problem with some of the replication solutions I've seen is every time they, take, they start taking uh, you know, a, a replica, they'll, they transfer everything over. In this case, we will only transfer what's needed. If you transferred something in the past, it'll take a diff, ask the other cluster, do you have this piece, and only ship data that's needed there. And not just of the same VM. It is possible that you inherited or you snapshotted your VM from some other old VM that was earlier replicated to that cluster. We can still detect the diffs from that. So it's it's very flexible. So it's very very flexible. I'm sorry. You do that via extension um, We uh, we have a way of uh, tagging what we transfer over. We mention extents and we tag each extent where it originated from, and so we can actually tell oh, does it that okay. does that cluster so, have a extent? So you follow the parameters. Yeah. Tree. Right. So the interesting thing is you had a question on when you, whether you can kind of is there a one to many? So I could I could set up my DR policy to replicate from cluster one to cluster two and then later change it to replicate from cluster one to cluster three. Well, guess what? If cluster three had some bits that were transferred to cluster two and the cluster two transferred it over, we will still deduplicate. We will still find out that he, he has the bits that, I, that got to it somehow, and, and we will not ship it again. Seems very robust. Yeah. Is data in, in flight encrypted? Is data in flight encrypted? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but we don't do, exp do it explicitly. What you do is you set up your connection. The admins have to set up the connection between the two clusters. And that connection could be compressed or encrypted. So the policies on that connection are outside of the DR framework. But yes, the answer is yes, you can do it. So, so the, the, but the, the compression and encryption is performed by any tenants? The compression and encryption is a policy that's left to the connection establishment. We don't set up that connection. It's not done by any tenants. Okay. Okay. So, the so Telling me I can use a VPN which will encrypt the data is, if I want a yes or no answer to, is the data in flight encrypted? No, not yes. Because it's not encrypted it's by you, it's my responsibility to encrypt it. Right. Then it's not what we are releasing today, it is not going to be encrypted. We can definitely put a policy I, where we I, can. It's very I can, easy. I can yeah. buy that. I got no problem with that. 
but you be really, you know, just when you answer a yes or no question. Thank you. The question is, do you do this, not can I do this? Our keeps us honest. <laughs> we do not do this today. It is doable. Great. Uh, but we expect that the admins will have their own policies on how they connect to a different cluster. I agree. And so it is questionable whether we should even be doing it, whether we should even add that flexibility. Um, finally, um, it's distributed. So it's not like one node is transferring the data to the other side. All the nodes together participate in transferring the data. And that's why it's highly performant and highly scalable. I assume that means all the nodes that own extensive data that's going to be. Yes, wherever the data is local. Um, can I have different snapshot retention schedules? Yes. Anything else you want? No, that's about it. <laughs> All right. Works with SRM, but uh, you know, obviously our native stuff uh, works much better. So the next thing that we are announcing here in this forum is uh, support for compression. So compression is done by our system such that it is completely transparent to the guest VMs. So the guest VMs are not the ones trying to say, oh, here's my file, gzip it, or something like that. It just does it underneath the covers. The guest VMs don't even know. We have VM-specific compression policies. So you can put a policy on each VM or a group of VMs. No compression, low, medium, high compression, and even something which we call async versus sync compression. I'll go into that in detail uh, in a minute. But I want to emphasize that our compression policies are not the whole file system or the whole LAN or the whole volume based. You can put policies at a very fine grain per VM or a group of VMs. So we support both sync and async compression. I think sync is something that a lot of vendors do. I think people understand it quite well. You write the data, and right away it's get, it gets compressed. The problem is that you pay the overhead of compression in your critical path. Async compression is interesting. It says, you don't compress it when you write it because your data is hard. You compress it based on a policy which says, when is the data getting cold? Is it considered cold after half an hour or after one day? That's when you compress. And that's something we can do by running a MapReduce, which goes to the data, figures out which part of it is uncompressed and cold, and goes and compresses it. OK, the, the common terms of work there are inline and post-process as opposed to synchronous and asynchronous? Sure. So, yes, um, the, uh, well, the other terms I've heard is inline and offline. And sometimes the offline gets confused by, you know, people think that, oh, you have to bring the system offline before you can do it. That's why I prefer the terms uh, sync and async. Um, it's very clear. It's asynchronous versus synchronous. It's, it's, it's not clear to people who dealt with the 27 other vendors who call it inline and post-process. Yeah, post-process. Post-process, right yeah. Um, mm. You have a question? Right? If, when you're doing inline, Compression. Yeah. It's on ingest before it hits the SSD, and therefore increases the effective size of the SSD as a cache. Correct. Correct. And the main advantage of uh, you know post post process compression is um, it delivers the savings without the perceived overhead. So and and it does it when the cluster is going to idle. So it you know when the cluster is going to idle, you do your compression. So the users never see the overhead. There's a subtle question that uh, was hidden in your uh, last question, which was about the fact that Nutanix, the flash uh, tier is not just a caching tier. It's also a true blue tier. So that's why we write to it as well. It's not just the fact that we just read from it and then keep it as a cache and a spillover of the DRAM itself. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't imply that cache meant write through as opposed to a write back cache. Sure. Yeah. But you know, yeah, I mean, there are, uh, there are vendors out there who only use the flash for caching. They call it a flash cache. There are, there are, there are vendors out there who only use the, the flash as a write-through cache, and there are other vendors that use it as a write-back cache. Yeah, and for us, and and for us it's neither, actually. It's not a cache at all. It's, it's a true blue tier. And if you keep the uh, data there in maybe two caches or in two uh, flashes, it's never stored in the spindle. OK, so when, so, so when data's been, been cold, and becomes hot, it gets copied from the disk up to the flash, and then the disk space is reused. Yes, I think maybe you already explained some of that. When that cools off again, you have to go through all the work of copying it from the flash back to the disk. Yes. Because you, it, you, it, it might even be written in that time, right? 
So uh, what you have in the, in the disk may get stale by them. So um, at this point, I also want to take a small pause. Uh, so this is sort of the first half of my talk. The second half of the talk talks about more features. I want to open up uh, for more questions um, you know, for, on the stuff that I just discussed. Um, I think Howard, you wanted to actually bring up a point of are you doing wasteful work by trying to move data back and forth too much? I guess that might be the implied well, question the, the, there. The trade-off between, you know, you have multiple tiers of storage. The, the trade-off between using it as a cache, using the, the faster tier as cache, and let's assume that it's a write-back cache, um, is as a write-back cache, you're wasting, you're wasting capacity on the, the slower tier because there's a copy of that data that's, that's not being accessed because it's in the faster tier. Mm -hmm. And you can trade that off by saying, I'm not going to store that copy. I'm only going to have one copy. But that means if you have rapidly varying workloads, the same data is sometimes going to be hot and sometimes going to be cold. And you're going to use CPU and storage bandwidth to copy the, data, the same data up and down between the tiers. Yes. You know, I, I think they're both per perfectly valid techniques. It's just you're right. There are you're right. There, for making there are there are some trade-offs you can make, and you can tune your policies. We don't do it, um, but you can definitely have a use case where it might be more, more beneficial to keep the data on the setup, you know, for some more time or something like that. If you're shoving data back and forth too much. Yeah. No. And, and you know, and it depends on how you know if, if you're doing, you know, if you're running applications that are more throughput sensitive, then you know, you really the disk is going to be fine. Right. You're not looking for IOPS. You know, there's lots of there are trade-offs to be made. And all, you know, I, yeah, I think, I think there's a. I think it's really, yeah. You know, the the main thing about doing what you guys are doing, which is you know what we would generically call sub-one tiering, is is the granularity small enough? Because some of the mainline storage folks, you know, promote and demote data 42 megabytes at a time, and so. You know, a 100k index in your Oracle database that's getting hammered means 41 meg of other data uses your flash. That's very inefficient. Yep. So our and unit of unit of uh, ILM is one megabyte, and if it's compressed, it's even less. It could be 200k actually. Right. So one 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 meg of yeah. source data. Yeah. And the other yeah the other problem you see with some of the more traditional sub one tiering problems is the schedule that. You know, the decision what to promote or what to demote is made once a day. And you know, that's driving down the highway looking in your rear view mirror saying, you know, with the data pattern, access pattern I had yesterday is going to be good for what I'm doing today. Yeah. And you know, I'm assuming that you guys are doing this on some level of close to continuous basis. Yeah. So the up migration happens pretty much in real time um, because you're tagging your hot stuff. You're saying, oh, I'm repeatedly going to this piece of data that's sitting on the SIRA. It ought to be sitting in FIO or, or your PCI SSD. Yeah. Move it up right away. Um, but the down migrate happens, you know, in the background in the MapReduce. Okay, there's stuff sitting on the PCI SSD that you know is not being referred to anymore. Let's move it down. Well, the problem is if you're moving up continuously, yeah, you have to be moving down continuously Correct. to make space. Correct. <laughs> you know. Yeah. True. Yeah, so, so uh, I think when you say continuously, data also has access patterns that have hysteresis built in. So workloads are, now I, I can come up with a pathological case where it says oh, it's always moving up and down, but e one of two things is happening. Either the application was actually doing something bizarre, or our backend system was down migrating for no reason. It was actually just being too aggressive trying to down migrate as well. Actually, let me, let me answer that a diff well, little bit. Well, you have periodic workloads. You, you have the VDI boots happen in the morning, you have the the data warehouse build happens over the weekend. You know, there's a lot, you know, we don't think about it anymore, but we still run lots of batch processes. And, you know, those things happen dynamically. So, you know, there's always change. Yeah, but it's not minutes, though. It's still hours. And I think our system actually, that, you know. So one interesting aspect. That, that's arguable. One so interesting cool. aspect of our design is that uh, when you want to, let's say, up migrate, it's not just, you're not just looking at the PCA SSD in one node. You can actually spill over to all the other PCI SSDs. So you, so, so. Right, so the, 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 pool, the pool is large. Larger, and yeah. Yeah. And, and if you see that pattern happen, you know, you, it can happen. Uh, your working set doesn't fit in the PCI SSD. I'd argue that you need to add one more block uh, so to grow your, kind of, kind of your story. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, right? if you're, if, 
yeah, the, you know, the, the, the problem your model can run into is, you know, the, where it's an 80% 80, 80 or so fit that there's going to be thrash. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, if it's, if, if it's lower or you didn't have enough flash, it didn't matter how you're managing it. True. And if it's 95%, then it's fine. And yeah, at some point where... Any, any storage design yeah, the, could have, you know, could world, run into pathologies. The world is yeah. made of compromises. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what we have works pretty well for our customers. Um, so continue on. Yeah. 